Uh, my talk here is about blockchain technology and applications. So, uh, interesting ways you can apply blockchain technology in use cases that um, I believe are interesting. Uh, we're a blockchain infrastructure company. Uh, previously, I was the CEO at BTCC, also, B also known as BTC China. And before that, I was at Ubisoft uh, working on games. So, Blockstream is a blockchain infrastructure company. We do a lot of different things. But I guess uh, you could say everything we do ties back into making Bitcoin better. So we contribute to the main Bitcoin protocol. We have uh, one person full-time contributing to protocol development. Uh, we have two developers contributing to Lightning. And uh, we have an assortment of other product offerings. So we have Liquid um, and many more. I'll go into those in the next slide. So Liquid is a federated sidechain. It's a sidechain that's pegged to Bitcoin. It's a one-to-one -one peg, so if there's 21 million Bitcoins, there's 21 million Bitcoins in Liquid. And you can only access Bitcoins in Liquid when you lock up one on the main chain. Uh, next up is Green Address. It's a multi-signature Bitcoin wallet. And then we have Elements, which is our blockchain platform. So you can take the source code there. Liquid is actually derived from Elements. So you can take the Elements source code, it's all open source, and build your own blockchain. Uh, we also have uh, an offering called Blockstream Satellite. It is uh, a service where we launch, we lease space on uh, geosynchronous satellites uh, and broadcast the Bitcoin blockchain back to Earth. So we don't have Asia coverage yet, but that's coming in the next month or so. But there's two key things that this allows, and one of them is redundancy. So an undersea cable could be cut in a country like, say, Malaysia and all the nodes, Bitcoin nodes there, will still be functional. They can get the blocks over uh, blockchain satellite. The second thing is it reduces the need for bandwidth. So if you're in a country where bandwidth is expensive, you can get the five or six gigabytes of Bitcoin's blockchain every month for free. And it won't eat into your bandwidth allocation. Uh, we also have one more thing that's on the slide. It's a cryptocurrency data feed that we built in partnership with ICE. ICE is the owner of the New York Stock Exchange. So we're aggregating trading data from uh, about 15 exchanges and 44 currency pairs into this feed for institutional traders and uh, people that want to trade. Uh, so some of our open source contributions, as I mentioned, we contribute to Bitcoin, uh, Lightning. We also have something called Lightning Charge. It's a WordPress plugin that lets uh, web developers quickly access uh, Lightning and do cool things like uh, apps, we call them lightning apps. So you can buy and sell, uh, sell digital content, uh, you can have a paywall in place. Uh, we also have Simplicity, it's a smart contracting language that uh, we're still in the process of developing, but it's uh, meant to be rolled out in elements initially and then potentially in Bitcoin. So blockchain technology is uh, very big buzzword. A lot of people are interested in what they can do with a blockchain. So the question to answer is, what is a blockchain? This is just a definition from Wikipedia. Uh, but it's a decentralized and distributed di digital ledger that's used to record transactions across many computers so the record cannot be altered retroactively without alteration of subsequent blocks and the collusion of the network. So this is essentially what the blockchain looks like under the hood. It's just blocks um, with the transaction data that's hashed. It's run through a one-way hash function. So you get a little snippet of um, data that comes out of the block, and that's appended to the next block. And in this way, you have a chain of blocks that you cannot alter unless you attack the network and you try to rewrite um, prior blocks. But that costs a lot of money in Bitcoin because you have to have uh, mining equipment, you have to have power, and all the facilities to host it. So that's where Bitcoin gains its security and immutability from, just from high cost of attack. So a blockchain is simply a data structure. It's, uh, you could say it's a really slow database. Uh, it doesn't solve problems inherently. It can solve certain problems, but typically you would want to build something that has a good fit for the use case. So one of those is trust minimization.
So right now we live in a world of trust. Trust is our only option uh, when we interact with uh, any institution. We have to trust them with data, um, like the previous presentation was talking about. You have to trust them to hold your personal information. But um, there's also no way to verify things too. So if you're banking, you have to trust that the bank has your money. And in some countries, the banks are actually fractional. And when word of this gets out, people do a run on the bank and the whole banking system could collapse. Also, you are reliant on third-party audits, so you can't actually audit the bank. You can't phone the bank and say, you know, how much money do you actually have in this branch or how much do you have in your vault. You can't really find out. And you hope that they do have audits and that, that everything's in order. Uh, but what blockchains could allow us to do is to rethink trust. There's an error there, so the first line should not be there. Uh, but blockchains can allow for real-time audit. So if you're running a Bitcoin full node, you can actually audit in real time. You can see all the transactions. You can validate a transaction. When you send a transaction, you know if it's confirmed or not confirmed. But the key is that you have that power to check for yourself. Um, it's a public ledger of transactions, so everyone can see what's happened on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, you don't need permission to ask um, someone. You don't, need to, you don't need to ask somebody, can I see that transaction? You can download it and see for yourselves. Uh, we have secure cryptographic tokens. So these are tokens that cannot be counterfeited and duplicated. And it operates over an open internet. So a lot of the private blockchain solutions, they're um, you know, connected through VPNs. So they don't really, uh, they're not really battle tested in that they cannot function over open internet uh, unobstructed. And also every node has a copy of the data. So every Bitcoin node contains the whole history of every transaction that's ever happened. So all these things make up what I think is the key uh, attributes of a blockchain. And it's basically taken from Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the first uh, blockchain. So from a user perspective, when you're rethinking trust, you're moving from IOUs, from a trusted intermediary, to a digital bearer asset. So, a digital bearer asset is essentially something that you, uh, well, bearer asset is something you have. So gold is a bearer asset. Um, there are certain types of uh, bonds and certificates that are also bearer assets. So if you have the certificate, then you have the asset. If you lose the certificate in a fire, then you lose the asset uh, corresponding to that. But gold is probably the best example. So if you lose a piece of gold, then it, you, it's gone. You can't phone somebody and say, you know, can you get it back for me? But for fiat currencies, you can call the bank if you have a fraudulent transaction on your credit card, you can say this wasn't me and maybe provide some proof and they can undo that transaction. But from a user perspective, it's moving from one world into another world and it's difficult to adjust your mental model because everyone has grown up in this world where everything is an IOU. Right? Uh, from a custodian's perspective, like say from a bank's perspective, um, it provides more security in insecure environments. So, uh, one of the easiest attack vectors is an inside attack. So someone working at that bank uh, with access to the systems or network access, they can add a zero here and essentially print money out of thin air and, or steal money. Uh, but if you're dealing with uh, digital currencies like Bitcoin, then you can't really do that. It's kind of a, a safety measure. People can still steal the, physical, steal the digital asset, but they cannot copy and manipulate the system. So this part of the presentation is going into Liquid, um, uh, the Strong Federation sidechain that we're launching soon. Uh, I might skip through some of the slides because I only have 20 minutes. But Liquid is an inter-exchange settlement network that allows funds to be moved rapidly between exchanges and other financial institutions. Um, so what it does is uh, different exchanges are running a functionary box. It's a piece of hardware that is signing off on a block. So Bitcoin is secure through proof of work, where the miners are you know, competing in a contest to generate a valid block. But here, everyone is uh, signing the block. So if two-thirds of the functionaries uh, agree on a valid block, then the blockchain is extended. Um, it's a strong federation, meaning the design of it is secured in the nature of uh, the parties in the federation. So the interest of all the parties, if they're pegging in Bitcoin, is that they have, uh, their motivation is to secure the network because they don't want to attack the network and risk the loss of their own funds. 
Um, so the exchange is essentially operate the network. We, are, we are provide the technology and we build the hardware, but the exchanges are the ones actually uh, running the network once we've launched it. So we can actually manage the network. We cannot tell, we cannot say more people can join once it's launched. It's um, decentralized, so it's the group that launches the network that operates the network in the future. A lot of solutions out there that try to accomplish inter-exchange settlement, but they're just saying, you know, use a token, maybe possibly ERC-20 token, and it's like an IOU, and it's not much better than you know, a typical IOU in any system. Um, also, Liquid enhances privacy through confidential transactions. So within the network, nobody can actually see the transactions that are moving back and forth. Uh, the sender and receiver can validate that it's a legitimate transaction, that the, you know, everything adds up and there's nothing being printed, no money being printed. But outsiders can't see. So what that allows is prevention of front running. So we can see on a public blockchain like Bitcoin, when someone moves, say, 100,000 coins to an exchange, well, they're probably moving them to dump or sell because they just uh, had a token sale or something. But this will actually prevent a lot of that front-running behavior because everything is hidden. So there is no costly proof of work. Um, functionaries are used and they're mutually distrusting participants. So all the exchanges and institutions securing the network don't have to trust one another. Uh, when they're running the functionary box, it's essentially a black box. They cannot do anything other than unplug their box, and in which case, if less than two-thirds are online, then the network will stop for a period of time. But they cannot manipulate any transactions, they can't see the transactions, and they cannot um, do anything to attack the others in the network. Um, but yeah, the role is essentially to sign off on actions in the chain, and then they're verified against the protocol rules, and approved by the other functionaries. So, Liquid is uh, built on top of one of the innovations from Blockstream, which is the two-way peg. So, we actually founded the company after a white paper was written, uh, the Strong Federation white paper was written, and that's the, about the two-way peg, essentially. So, it's about locking up Bitcoins on the main chain and unlocking in the side chain. So, this can be used in many different applications. So, uh, right now, it's a one-to-one -one peg from Bitcoin to Liquid because we want a one-to-one -one ratio because it's meant for settling large amounts of Bitcoin um, with uh, rapid transfer, transfer times. But you could also peg in Bitcoin and issue um, airline points or something at a higher ratio, but it would be pegged back to an asset class. So the federated peg, this is a diagram, you can see that Bitcoin pegs into a sidechain. Within this sidechain, we can have issued assets. So it's, uh, issued assets are similar to like tokens in Ethereum, um, except for it's much more uh, simple to issue. You run an RPC call, you can issue a token. Uh, you don't have to write a smart contract and audit the security of a smart contract. It's much more simple and straightforward. Uh, but the peg is secured by watchman functionaries, which are essentially watching the network to make sure everything's in order. And the watchman secure assets, assets by signing the transactions on both the chains. So this is just a, a diagram showing um, how assets are frozen and then pegged in, and then liquid assets are frozen and then released on the main chain. But everything can move fluidly through this network. Uh, so Bitcoin's blockchain is extended by uh, a group of block signers, so essentially the miners, def demonstrating proof of work. And liquid, it's a set of signers in a federation. This is just a diagram showing how it reaches consensus in the block signing. I think I'll skip it. So yeah, sidechains and strong federations were developed as technical solution to problems that blockchain users face, which is transaction latency. Um, it takes time for blocks to confirm in the Bitcoin blockchain. Based on variance in hash rate, it could take up to an hour to reach confirmation if the difficulty went up and there's not enough hash rate. Uh, also, privacy, as I mentioned, fungibility, and reliability. So, when do you need a blockchain? I think there's four main points. You want audibility and verifiability. Multiple parties need to write information. And the multiple parties don't necessarily trust each other. And we require data redundancy and resiliency. So, it's actually 
a lot of use cases that I see uh, for blockchains, they could uh, just as well have done it with a database because every party can actually trust a central authority. Uh, blockchain is typically most useful when it's adversarial, that you don't need to trust anybody. That's why in Bitcoin, there's proof of, in proof of work uh, securing of the blockchain, we actually expend a lot of energy, a massive amount of energy. And if we could all trust each other, then we wouldn't need to expend that energy to secure the system. So you need a blockchain when you have a need for a trustless decentralized system that must operate in adversarial conditions. So now let's go on to blockchain applications. Um, I have a few examples of areas that I think are well suited for using a blockchain. First is banking. So banking, you have currency issuance. Uh, it's reliant on trust. Bill creation, like printing of actual money or minting of coins, is expensive. Uh, paper money wears and tears, it gets destroyed over time, and it needs replacing. Also, anti-counterfeiting measures constantly need updating. So, you know, it went from pure paper to holograms, holograms with uh, little stripes in them. But it's a constantly a battle to counter uh, counterfeiting. Also, quantitative easing or inflation is not entirely visible. So you're reliant on porting of policy and hoping that that's actually what happened when the money supply is inflated. And inflation is a separate issue, that's not good either. Uh, also for solvency, you're relying on trust. Uh, you have to trust that the bank has the money. You have to do audits. Audits are expensive typically and time consuming and you have to rely on a third party auditor. And audits are periodic, whereas with the Bitcoin blockchain, Audits are continuous and ongoing. So rethinking banking, I think uh, if you were using a blockchain, if you're a central bank that was issuing a national currency using a blockchain, you can actually have some gains here. So everything would be on-chain, it would be instant and public. Um, you could have a network of banks rather than just one central authority. So typically you could have a central bank and all the major banks in a country um, securing a strong federation and with the central bank taking care of the issuance. Uh, it would be easily validated and security would be handled by cryptography so then you don't have to deal with uh, counterfeit, countermeasures for counterfeiting. And also it would be publicly auditable. So imagine the money supply of a country is actually publicly audible. That's definitely a game changer. Um, also, for solvency, you can have cryptographically verified proof of reserves. Every bank can show that they're not fractional, and it would probably encourage better, more ethical behavior in banks too. Probably less an issue for more well-developed nations, but definitely an issue for less developed nations. Uh, it would be instantly auditable, um, and um, as I mentioned, you could have a strong federation of banks that manage assets, and you could have third-party asset, asset issuance on this blockchain that is trackable. So you could actually issue um, debt and credit on the blockchain as well uh, by doing an issued asset in that blockchain. Uh, but most importantly, the banks can offer customers proof that their deposits are included in audits. That's not something you can have right now. Uh, stock trading is another area where we could use uh, blockchain. So typically, it's a trusted third party holding stock. So when you sign up for a trading account, um, the stocks are not in your possession. They're held by you know, the stock brokerage or bank. Uh, there's high fees and commissions. It's because they have to deal with a lot of the overhead, then they pass along those costs to the users. Um, there's also a lot of account restrictions, and it's a centralized system, and it is very vulnerable to outages, uh, sometimes for days. <laughs> So if we're rethinking stock trading and we want to issue stocks on a blockchain, uh, we could have exchanges operate with private blockchain. Companies can issue their own stock in the blockchain um, as an on-chain issued asset. And you could trade stocks for other assets using atomic swap. So the benefit of having a blockchain is that you can do atomic swaps, especially like with liquid where all the assets are inside one blockchain. It's very easy to swap one for another. So there is no custodial ship. Um, exchange, exchanges can provide a service to help traders find mutually agreeable transactions. So basically facilitate those atomic swaps by maintaining an order book. 
Uh, you don't need the custodianship, and settlement would be nearly instant. So actually, when you complete a transaction uh, on some stock trading platform, it's not necessarily finalized right away. There is some time for the clearance, which would be resolved by using a blockchain. Inter-exchange settlement. Um, so, actually, it'd be, it'd be inter-bank settlement. Banks have to maintain a chain of relationship uh, relationships, and each chain has to be trusted. And tra successfully transacting relies on every bank in the in the chain, and it is slow and expensive. That's why it is slow to do wire transfers in uh, international wire transfers. Probably is fine within a country, but it's also expensive because they pass these costs on to you, the users. But this is just an example of an uh, international uh, wire transfer. You have to go through a series of correspondent banks and, and back. So it, it, it actually is very cumbersome and it relies on these interbank relationships. If you've done a wire transfer, then you know sometimes you have to actually enter the correspondent bank information as well. But rethinking this inter-exchange settlement, you could have these issues, uh, assets issued again on a blockchain and they can move between any bank. And it'd be really real-time auditable, cryptographically secured, without trusted third parties, and probably 100 times faster than legacy financial networks. And it is, it'll also be confidential, yet auditable. So with confidential transactions, you can still do an audit by providing a blinding key. So blockchain technology will replace and redefine today's financial infrastructure by solving trust limitations. I think the best use cases uh, for blockchain will be somewhat financial in nature and they will change the paradigm of how uh, we use trust or not use trust. So this is the slogan that we like to use at Blockstream which is don't trust, verify. So with any blockchain you should be able to verify, otherwise it's just a slow database. <laughs> 